Her Old Testament reading is taken from Isaiah 7, verses 10 to 16. <coughs> Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Glory to you, O Lord. Joseph accepts Jesus as his son. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the, the name Jesus. And now Tim's going to come and give the sermon to us this morning. Let's just pray for Tim as he comes. Lord, we thank you for Tim. We thank you for the words you have given him this morning, and we pray that we will use them to get closer to you and to love you more. Amen. So, as Jenny read, uh, the prophecy of uh, Isaiah, and uh, that prophecy was, uh, was set amidst uh, a pretty current uh, crisis in the nation of Judah. They were the last uh, remaining nation that was supposed to be under God's rule and direction, and not under the rule of men. So here they are. And the kings of Syria and Israel are ready to invade and remove uh, Judah's king Ahaz because he won't side with them against those all-conquering Assyrians. And uh, Isaiah, under God's direction, calls on this king Ahaz of Judah to have faith. It's a call to faith in the midst of life's crises, seemingly overwhelming crises for Judah. Keep calm and don't be afraid. Trust God and not your own human intriguing and planning. For God knows your future and how it will turn out. See, through uh, Isaiah, God is seeking to persuade Ahaz that if only he will rely on him as the king of Judah, then the things that he fears, losing his, uh, his kingdom, his power and his prestige. They won't happen if he would just trust in God and rely on him. But I, the Lord, this is what Isaiah says, but I, the Lord, declare that this will never happen. So have faith. If your faith is not enduring, then you will not endure. I sort of thought of played with that for a little bit and came up with this phrase. Hold God in doubt and you'll not hold out. 
hold God in doubt and you'll not hold out in your faith. And I quite like that sort of way of remembering. I think if there's uh, anything we want to take away from uh, today's Bible reading, reading, it would be that. Don't hold God in doubt because otherwise you won't hold out in your faith. What does Ahaz, Ahaz do? He relies on his own strength and strategy. And um, I don't know why, there was a sort of song that came to mind as I was uh, thinking about this, and uh, you'll probably recognise it. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. Regrets I've had a few, but then again too few to mention. I did what I had to do, I saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the highway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. That could well have been Ahaz's uh, signature tune, as well, obviously, as uh, old Blue Eyes himself, Frank Sinatra. Now, I don't know how uh, well that turned out for, uh, for Frank in his own life, but for Ahaz, that approach to life turned out quite badly. Ahaz is a picture of mankind relying on its own resources to secure its future without any reference to God. And in Ahaz's case, it's a physical future, a political future, ruling over his own lands through his own efforts. Seeking, we can only guess, to, to keep the things that were important to him, power, security, a future. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the Book of Chronicles also records what the fruits of relying on one's own plans and directions can lead to. It says, to a life of wickedness and idolatry. And in the end, that's what happened to Ahaz. And his reputation, actually, was so tarnished that he wasn't even deemed fit to be buried in the royal tombs in Jerusalem. Sort of like the ultimate... Um, sort of snub to him. He was that bad that they said, we're not burying you with the other kings in Jerusalem. You're not worthy of it. So in, in short, in ignoring God's direction and provision for his life and the life of his nation, of Judah, things turned out badly. And often that's the case, isn't it, in our own lives. If we rely on our own human strength, and our own human desires, then things do turn out badly. Enter into this situation, this state of chaos and distrust, this uh, time when Ahaz was worried about what was going to happen. These big powers were about to gang up on him. Enter into that chaos and distrust, this sign that Isaiah brought, this sign of Emmanuel, the prophecy about a future child. First, Isaiah offers to Ahaz God's promise that he will send him a sign. And he could choose that sign, a sign that would confirm to Ahaz that God's word could be trusted. It could have been from the depths of the earth or the highest place in heaven, literally from anywhere and anything that would have helped Ahaz to trust in God. And I, I thought, I wonder what, what would you choose? If you were doubting God in your life, what sign would you choose to help you? Ahaz is being offered a sign, but he's not having any of anything of it. God's offer of a sign is a call to faith. It's a call to use his will to rely on God. But he waves the offer aside and he just rejects God's offer completely. He's already made up his mind. For him, faith will play no part in his religious life or in the life of politics that he's engaged in. He wasn't interested in any kind of sign. He was going to follow his own path. He wanted to do it my way. I wonder what, as I said earlier, what we would have chosen as a sign that God has our future firmly secure in his hands. I'll bet if we didn't know the Christmas story, we would have 
wouldn't have chosen the sign that God sends either. So through Isaiah, God replaces the offer of a sign for this day with his own wonderful sign. Isaiah, Ahaz has rejected God's offer. And so God says, okay, I'm going to send a sign. A sign to the whole world, wider than just for you in the nation of Judah. It's going to be a wonderful sign. The heart of that sign, of course, is Emmanuel. And in the Old Testament reading, who Emmanuel is remains unsaid. But it's not going to be an army to secure a political and national future. While Ahaz call, calls in an army, God looks to the birth of a child. What a contrast. Ahaz wants an army. God looks to the birth of of a child. Of course in Isaiah as we will read over Christmas many times it becomes more clear who this child will be. But this morning the good news is we don't have to wait do we to find out what that sign is and what it means. We can fast forward to that reading in Matthew and see the sign that Isaiah speaks about. So what sign does God choose to assure, of, to assure us that his plan for us, each of us individually, can be trusted? It is the sign of Emmanuel. It's a baby conceived for Mary, not through natural means, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. The sign of Emmanuel. We have so many wonderful uh, carols at Christmas that speak about Emmanuel, God with us. This child born to us. Well, let's think about that again for a few moments, that sign that God has sent to us and see if we can uh, explore its truths and perhaps uncover something new uh, about um, the sign of Emmanuel uh, this Christmas time. I think the first thing I would say is got to be without the great without doubt the greatest sign that God has ever given us and it's a call to put our trust and faith in him so that our future is secure it's a sign that says don't hold God in doubt and if you don't then you will hold out this special sign this special birth that stands out from every other birth. What a sign that God has given us, this sign of Emmanuel. This year allow it once again to speak to your hearts and your minds, allow it to strengthen your faith. For this sign is amazing, it talks about our salvation individually not the salvation of a nation but our salvation and it tells us three key things about God's plan for each one of us and for the whole world firstly that salvation comes where from the Lord when the angel announces that that Mary will become pregnant she says how is this possible since I am a virgin she wasn't daft was she I can't possibly become pregnant because I'm a virgin. And the angel reassures her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and God's power will rest on you, as it says in Luke's account of the birth narrative. But what does this sign of a virgin birth tell us? Well, it shows us that salvation ultimately comes from the Lord. In Matthew's account, in Matthew's Gospel, he writes, You will name him Jesus, Emmanuel, because he will save his people from their sins. Of course, that's a long way off in the life of Jesus. But uh, just as God had promised in Genesis that the seed of the woman would ultimately destroy the serpent or Satan, so God about has brought about our salvation by his own power, not through human effort. The virgin birth tells us that salvation comes from 
the Lord. Neither Joseph nor Mary were involved in the conception or its timing. The virgin birth reminds us that salvation comes from God and not through the will of a husband, but through the Holy Spirit, through God. Salvation is the work of God himself. Secondly, the virgin birth made possible the uniting of Jesus as both fully human and fully divine in one person, the person we worship. We, we worship someone who's not just human, but is God himself. God has sent his son into the world as a man, both fully human and fully divine. Started out as a baby, but of course he would have had to, or how else would it have been possible? If he just sort of popped up as a grown person directly from heaven, as I'm sure God could have fashioned, we might doubt his humanity. We might not be able to treat the resurrection as anything remarkable, because this was some sort of immortal superman that God had just sort of placed in the earth, on the earth, from heaven. But he didn't. He came fully human as we are, descended from Adam's line, born of a woman. If Jesus had just sort of popped up as a fully grown adult, we might not have been able to trust him uh, that, that that resurrection is the pattern for our own lives as we were born and we get old and die. We have to have that connection with this child who grows up and becomes our saviour. He is fully human and fully divine. Now of course it may have been uh, equally possible for Jesus to have been born naturally of both a human father and a human mother and for God, way, for God somehow to have sort of like implanted that divine nature uh, into him, into this human baby. But I think it would have been harder for us to understand how Jesus was fully God if that had been the case. No, the virgin birth speaks of a supernatural event, it speaks to us. This baby is human, goes through that nine-month development process and is born in the same way as you and I. But because of the virgin birth, is God, is Emmanuel, God with us. Fully human and fully divine. And the third thing about which is really important about the virgin birth. It makes it possible for Jesus both to be fully human, but also without inherited sin. As the, uh, the Bible tells us, our human uh, fallenness is what we inherit from Adam. But the fact that Jesus did not have a human father in Joseph means that that line of descent, although it was there sort of in theory, if you like, that's where Joseph had come from, there was no inherited sin from Adam. This wasn't a person born of a husband's will. And that inherited sin from Adam is broken. The fallenness that we all inherit is not to be found in Jesus. He is perfect. He is God. He is without sin. And that, of course, as we, uh, if we fast forward to the Easter story, is so important because it says... Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. He is that unblemished sacrifice, resembling and fulfilling once and for all that Passover sacrifice of the unblemished lamb, as we first read about in Genesis when the Israelites were released from their slavery in Egypt. So, three signs that the virgin birth was so important. It says to us, salvation comes from the Lord, not from human endeavour. It tells us that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine. He was and is God with us, Emmanuel. And it tells us that Jesus was without sin and could therefore be for us that unblemished Passover sacrifice, that lamb, that 
perfect lamb sacrificed for us as an atonement at Easter, a substitute for our human sinfulness, that he was able to reconcile us to God through his sacrifice. Three things about the virgin birth that are so important to our understanding of who God is, what God has done for us, and how we can respond. And so, as Isaiah said, we have been given that sign. He foretold it. It's a marvellous sign that salvation comes from the Lord. I hope this again, this uh, Christmas time, that it will speak to our hearts, our minds and our will and help us to give thanks once again for this wonderful sign from God that he has met us in humanity but also in divinity. He has brought us back into a living relationship with him through our faith. A faith that Ahaz did not demonstrate in his own life. But for us as Christians, we're not to be like Ahaz, relying on our own human intrigue and resources and planning. We are to hold on to God's promises and not to be insecure in our faith. What greater sign could God have given the human race that he loved us so much that he gave us his only son. And we celebrate again this year that wonderful sign. As you look around the church, there are many signs of uh, Christmas. This morning we had um, Thorpe Acre infants who came in. And for many of them, because of COVID, it's the first time that they've, uh, they've been inside a church building. One of the little girls, as she, as she came in, she sort of looked around at the wonder of this space and uh, said, where am I? Where am I? What place is this? And through explaining uh, the nativity story, through talking about, in slightly different terms, that wonderful sign that Isaiah uh, spoke about, my hope and prayer is that they too also this morning caught a glimpse of how God loves them and cares for them so much that he sent his son, a sign, Emmanuel, from heaven. That if we put our faith in him, then our future is secure. Amen. Thank you, Tim. There's a lot for us to reflect on there. So now, shall we declare our own faith by saying the Creed, which you'll find on page seven. So we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, 
We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now our prayers of intercession. When I say, prepare us for your way, O Lord, will you reply, your kingdom come, your will be done. Prepare us for your way, O Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, you know that we love you, and we know what do you ask us to do. But for those times when we've been too busy, when we've been hard-hearted, when we've been lukewarm, we say sorry and ask for your forgiving love. Prepare us for your way, O Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, you know our good intentions and we know your will. But hold us back long enough to listen to those in need and to learn from them, and to learn of our own need. Where we think we are sent, make us ready to receive. Where we are keen to teach, make us ready to learn. Prepare us for your way, O Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, you know our deepest desires, and we know the vision of your kingdom. We bring before you those elements in our lives in need of your transforming power. That which we misuse or neglect. That we most reluctantly let go of. That which we believe is not good enough. Inspire us and disturb us to examine our deepest desires. Prepare us for your way, O Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, you know our potential, but what is the, your purpose for our lives? In our uncertainty and in the knowledge of your faithfulness, prepare us for your way, O Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 